Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate. Today I'm interviewing Janelle Patrick. Hi, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Well, thank you so, so much for coming on. And just first question right off the docket, could you tell me about your books? Well, they are all set in Japan. Um, I've lived there off and on since 2003. And I actually started writing them because when I moved back to America the first time, I was so homesick for Japan that I just would write for four hours a day just to spend more time there. <laughs> so um, the latest one called The Last T-Bowl Thief um, that's coming out uh, October 20th is a little different than the others. And it's because one of the main characters is actually an American living in Japan. Um, and it's also a mystery, but not a murder mystery. It's, uh, it's about a T-bowl that goes missing. And for 300 years, it passes from one person to the next and changes all their lives as it comes, goes through their life before it goes on to the next person. That sounds awesome. So you mentioned that all your books are set in Japan. Do you think that, at, that in the future, your books will also be set there? I think they will be. Um, and the reason is that there are so many people who write super well about being an American in America. So I don't think I can add a ton to that like body of work. But I do know a lot about Japan just from having been immersed there for so long. And because I just, I love everything about it, even the irritating things. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. I mean, possibly even especially the irritating things. So like, for example, one time I went to the bank to um, exchange a bunch of used um 10,000 yen notes to give for a wedding present because you're supposed to give like, you know, like new bills for a wedding present. And so I go in and I stand in line at the cashier like I, like, you know, like I would in America. And I hand over these bills and they're like, oh, excuse me, could you wait over there for a moment? It turns out like it's a huge deal to exchange used bills for new bills in Japan. Oh. And it was so annoying. They wanted me to fill out this giant form. Afterwards, I was thinking, well, why is that? You know, and so you run up against stuff like that, and it really makes you think. I mean, it makes me think more than I would think about that if it happened in America. In America, I'd just be sort of annoyed. Yeah. So, what interested you in writing about Japan specifically, and like in the entire area? Um, I think part of it was that there are these subcultures there um, that are just not like anything we ever see in America. And they're not subcultures that people know a lot about even in Japan. Um, one of my books is uh, set in a host club. So in Japan, there are these um, nightclubs where uh, the best known ones are hostesses entertain businessmen. But there's also places where super attractive young men entertain women. Most foreigners and even a lot of Japanese have never been to a host club. They don't know what it's like to be in this environment where this super attract you're paying the super attractive guy to flirt with you basically um and so i wanted to explore those places when i was there because i was interested in it but i also wanted to show it to um the rest of the world you know and feeling like i could be a bridge between japan which seems like a really alien place to a lot of people but actually people are people all over the world and they commit the same crimes and they feel the same ways, but a lot of times they commit crimes like for a different reason than we might in America. And so I thought, gosh, you know, that actually might be kind of interesting to people. I love that idea so much that you that you're the bridge over those. But can we just quickly go back? You said that you that they don't usually let foreigners into the host club. How were you able to get in? Okay, I had to deploy a relative. So my husband is half Japanese and his, so his mother's Japanese and she comes from a big family in Tokyo. And I talked, was talking to one of my relatives and saying, gosh, I'd really love to go to a host club, but I can't figure out how to get in. I've tried everything. I've like walked around Kabuki Cho and they're like shilling and getting people in. And they won't even talk to me, even though I speak Japanese. Like I can't figure it out. She goes, oh, she goes, I, I actually play on a co-ed flag football team with a guy who's the manager of a host club. I'll ask him if we can go because I've always wanted to go too. I was like, no way. <laughs> so she went, she asked this guy who is the manager, who, by the way, uses an assumed name at the host club. And nobody at the host club knows that he is actually married with a high school age daughter. 
and nobody and his daughter doesn't know that he works at a host club. She thinks he manages a restaurant or something. So there's a this sort of stigma. It's not so like this being is a prostitute. Re- this was but, not in your novel. This part is all real? Yeah, this part oh, is wow. all real. And so I went with Yuki. And so Yuki and I went together. And if you're a foreigner going to a place where foreigners aren't usually ar- allowed, sometimes you can get in if you go with a Japanese person. And the reason that is, it doesn't have anything to do with language. I mean, I speak Japanese perfectly well. But it has to do with them being worried that a foreigner doesn't understand how things work. Like, for example, at a host club, um, there's no menu, no prices, and you have to pay in cash. So if you're a foreigner and you come and you're like, okay, well, can I have a martini? They're like, well, we don't serve martinis. We only have, you have to buy the whole bottle. Or, um, okay, um, here's my credit card to pay for it. It's really awkward for everyone if they have to explain, well, I'm sorry, you have to have cash and I hope you have cash because it might be really expensive. So if you go with a Japanese person, then um, they can be sure that they've explained how things work and that they're going to be sort of responsible for you. Um, that you're not going to do anything weird and embarrassing that'll make it a bad experience either for the people who work there or for the people at the next table. Um, and actually, it works the other way, too. I was just thinking about this today. Um, when I travel, I love traveling with another Japanese person. And the reason is that sometimes you get to see stuff that they would never offer to show two Japanese people traveling together because they're like, oh, yeah, they wouldn't be interested. They've seen it a million times. And they wouldn't offer to two foreigners traveling together because like, oh, what if they don't speak Japanese and we can't even talk to each other? But a foreigner and a Japanese together can go through a lot of doors that just aren't open to either one by themselves. That is so fascinating. So would you get inspired about like, oh, I want to write a novel about a host club, for example, before like going in and seeing it? Or would you get inspired because you saw it? or because you heard about it from someone? You know, usually I get inspired by things that I have done already. Like I'll be there and I'll think, this is just the greatest, insanest thing that I've ever experienced. And I totally want other people to know what this is like. Um, The host club I got interested in just because I was curious about it. I didn't really think I was going to write a book about it. But a lot of stuff, you know, really odd stuff I end up writing about. So Sometimes I specifically go to a thing thinking, okay, I think I'm going to write about this. Like there was one time um, I went to this steampunk event and the trains in Tokyo run until midnight and then they stop and then they start again at five in the morning. So if you don't get on that last train home, you're pretty much stuck until five in the morning unless you take a cab. So um, there are parties and events that basically start at midnight and end at five in the morning. So they take advantage of the club be, being a, the u- usual time people couldn't go to a club and they just sell tickets and then you're at the club all night, basically. So I went to the steampunk, got all dressed up, went to the steampunk event with a Japanese friend. And, you know, we were both pretty ready to leave by about two in the morning. It was like, okay, this is kind of fun. But I thought it's not weird enough to be, not Japanese enough really to be in the book. So we go outside and it's raining. Okay. So we're in the nightclub district. It's raining. There are no cabs to be had like for anything. There are hundreds of people wanting to hail every cab. So I'm like, okay, no trains. Well, what are we going to do now? And my friend said, well, I was just going to go to a comic book cafe and get a cubicle and wait till morning and then go home because it's too expensive to go to where I live from on a cab anyway. So I was like, okay, well, let's go. So we went to this comic book cafe and it was almost sold out, but there was still a double cubicle available. So we got it and, and we went into our little cubicle and there was our, you know, computer and our little hard bench. And we sort of propped ourselves in the corner and tried to sleep, but couldn't really, of course. And so I just sat there in this semi private cubicle for a few hours and listened to all the varieties of snores and noticed what you could get for free, free soft serve, free soft drinks. And. There were all these shoes lined up in the corridor outside because everyone takes their shoes off before they go into their their little cubicle. And sure enough, two books later, it wasn't the, you know, costumed steampunk event that made it into a novel. It was the comic book cafe. I love that so much. I love getting inspired in unexpected ways. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if it's unexpected for me, I think, oh, gosh, you know, I kind of want to surprise my readers, too. (laughs) So... 
Did you move to Japan to write about it, or did you get interest inspired to write your novels after you moved? I first started writing about them after I moved there. Um, but then now, of course, I go back and absolutely hit the ground running with a huge list of stuff that I want to check out, um, possibly for the next book. Okay, that's that's great. So do you ever base any of your characters off of real people that you met or like hide any Easter eggs in? Oh, my gosh. Okay, here's a super huge secret of writing novels. All the, People are like, are any of them autobiographical? And it's like, well, they're all me. And in some ways, like when you're a writer, even the bad guys are you. Like you can't really write what you don't know. And so in a way, all the characters are based on a real person or a real person's experiences. And those are mine. There was actually one character in one of my books who's a reporter. And I did write that character as sort of an homage to a guy named Jake Adelstein, who's a was the first, I think he was the first foreigner to ever write for a Japanese newspaper. And they assigned him to to um, cover the the organized crime, the Yakuza, because none of the other reporters, they get like death threats and they get threats to their families and none of the other ones wanted to do it. But they figured, okay, he's a foreigner. He doesn't have to play by our rules. So maybe it'll be okay if he reports on them. But he's just utterly legendary. And so I kind of wrote one character as a little, a minor character as a sort of an homage to him. But for the most part, the characters are all completely fictional. The one thing you can't, so sometimes people sort of ask also, you know, what, when you write international mysteries, you know, how much of it do you fudge or, you know, whatever. And I think both historical and international mysteries um, all the fiction, the fictional parts are the characters in the story, but all the details about the culture and the historical period and things like that, they have to be absolutely accurate. You have to be able to believe that, you know, people have to actually, if they quote something at a dinner party, you don't want them to be embarrassed. Can you share any tips for writing mysteries and specifically like international mysteries? Um, you know, my tips would be about writing, my main tip would be about writing anything in general. And that is, you got to ask your enemies to read it and tell you everything that's wrong with it. And the hardest thing I think for any writer to do is to hear that their golden prose that they've just slaved over is not perfect or that, that you know, that, that a reader actually hates that thing that you think is the cleverest thing you've ever written. Um, but Listening to people say what they don't like um, makes your book so much better. And for mysteries and international mysteries, and I think historical as well, that goes double. Because you can go down some rabbit holes and leave big gaping plot holes or or you 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 push your character to do something that the plot really demands and the readers say, I don't believe it. And you read it, they're like, I don't think they do that. And you're right, you know what, you're right, you're right, we got to fix that. Um, so I would say my tips for anybody who's writing is don't keep it a secret. Get that draft out there and give it to people and just gird yourself up to hear the things you don't want to hear, but that'll make the writing so much better. Yeah, that is very good advice. I write too. And everyone, please like listen to all of the criticism because it yeah. really enhances what you're doing. But it's so hard, you know, I mean, the first time someone did that, um, was actually when I was trying to get an agent for the first book I wrote. And I sent it out and there were like five that wanted to read the first few chapters and four were like, no thanks. And the fifth one was like, I want to talk to you on Saturday. And I was like, so excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to get an agent. I'm so excited. And I got on the phone with her and she spent an hour telling me how many ways that mail manuscript was an enormous failure. An oh. hour. And I was sitting there and I was taking notes. And fortunately in pencil, my tears were dripping onto the paper. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I thanked her profusely at the end. And the next day I looked at it and I thought, you know what? 90% of what she said is absolutely right. And so I um I tossed that manuscript out. I quit pitching it. And then I um started a new one. And that's the one that became my first book. But it, it wouldn't have been without her criticism. Have you ever had to kill like darlings like in any specific instances of your writing? All, oh, all my writers are my beautiful children. Sorry, all my novels are my beautiful children. You know, yes, I think everybody's got 
a couple of manuscripts that are on the shelf gathering dust and they're never going to see the light of day. And I don't know any published writers that don't have two or three of those, at least. So you mentioned putting yourself into your characters. It, does that help you get in touch more with figuring out what they would do in certain situations? And I think the question I'm really trying to get at is, like, do you go into like almost like a trance-like state when you're writing? Because you're like, oh, this is me. I know exactly what they'll do in this situation. Absolutely. And actually, I have to set alarms. Like if I have something to do during the day and I know I'm going to be writing, I have to actually set an alarm on my phone to go do the thing or I'll just write straight through whatever is on my schedule. And sometimes after when I'm really in like the middle of writing a novel, I actually set an alarm for every hour. So it makes me stand up and breathe and blink. Like I realized I was feeling really awful after my writing and I traced it back to the fact that I was so deep into working that I'd kind kind of forget to blink. I'd kind of forget to breathe. I, I wouldn't move. I'd be really sort of stiff and sore. Oh, it was wow. really strange. So how do you get that deep into the writing? I think when you are writing something that you love, something that you want to be writing, I think it's really easy to slip in. And writing is that for me, but I know other people who play golf or they paint or they um, they play music. And I think if you talk to anybody who does has a passion for something, they'll say the exact same thing. Like, I bet there are things that you do, right? I mean, is there anything that you do that you get into that state with? Oh, totally. Oh, yeah. Um, sometimes it happens with writing. I'm an actress, too. That happens a lot with that. Sometimes it even happens when I'm podcasting. But yeah, I yeah, I find that so interesting. That thing. It's like a creativity thing where you just totally zone out and your right brain takes over. Yeah, absolutely. But I, it doesn't necessarily even have to be creativity. I think it's anything that commands your 100% of your attention. Like, I never really understood, like, why do people like to golf? I was like, ew, never, mm, not for me. But people say they have to be thinking about so many things that they can't think about anything else while they're doing it. And I think there's, that's that, um, that state of thinking about only one thing passionately that ties all those things together. And I feel really lucky that for me, it's writing and, and I get a book at the end of it. But I think mm -hmm. for anybody, you know, if you find that thing you're passionate about, um, you'll just nip into that kind of state of being, possibly. For you, is writing ever like a meditation or like a therapy? I know for me that happens a lot. And I've interviewed some people and they say that it's like when they get into that trance. Sometimes like if they're having a hard time, it can work whatever that is out. I really envy people who write um, wonderful, insightful things from those hard places or, or from... Um, who can sort of write through a problem that they're having or an issue they're having and come to a better understanding of it by the end. Because if you can do that, then your readers also will. I mean, I think that's an enormous gift. I am not gifted in that way. <laughs> so I don't really um, use it as a form of meditation. Sometimes I write stuff that gets a little too close to the bone of how I feel, not how the character would feel. And I usually end up having to cut that. Because um, you got to be careful that all your characters aren't you too much. I mean, no one, basically too much Janelle. Nobody wants to read about a character of Janelle. I mean, a book of Janelle's. No, we could read a, I would read a book of, all about you because you're really interesting. As I know from this, like from this interview, I want to hear all about like your, like your travels and everything. You should write that book. I'd read that. <laughs> well, if, like if you read my fictional books, you'll know a lot about my actual traveling because I put a ton of that in. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm definitely going to have to go through and read all those. And everyone listening to this should as well. Please go support her. So were there any characters that you found harder to write than others and harder to separate from yourself? Yeah, actually. So in The Last T-Bowl Thief, the most recent one, the character that's the American character who lives in Japan, who's lived in Japan for eight years, was actually kind of hard to write. Because I didn't want to reveal too much of myself and too much of my experiences started getting in there. And 
It's interesting when you live in a place like Japan for a long time, there are things that you love about it and things you hate about it. I mean, you start out just loving it, everything about it you love. And I have heard living in Japan as a foreigner described as, it's like being in a weak acid bath. So at first you get in and it just feels nice and warm. And then you've been in for a while, it feels a little itchy. And then when you're in for a really long time, it, it sort of gets a little bit painful. And being there a long time, you become more and more aware, strangely enough, of how much you are not Japanese. And you have to come to terms with that or you can't stay. You have to just embrace being other. And I think this character, I avoided writing a character like that for four books. <laughs> and finally, um, in this last one, I decided, okay, you know what? It's time to write that character. And But it was hard to know what to put in and what to leave out. And for that, I relied a lot on my critics, my readers, who said, oh, no, 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 honey. You know, <laughs> you've, you've descended into bitter foreignerhood here. Just ax that paragraph. <laughs> oh. oh, no. Yeah. So do you have people, like, read as you're writing? Like, how do you do that? Do you send out a chapter at a time? Or what do you do in those scenarios? You know, I, I wait until I have absolutely the thing that I think is ready to send to my agent. I think it's like perfect. It's like really super golden prose. And I send it out to a series. I've, I've gotten it down to about five readers and I ask each of them to look for something different. And I rely on them to tell me different things about it. And they all come back and the whole thing gets rewritten. The thing about mysteries is that, uh, a lot of it relies on everything going off in different directions, but tying up neatly at the end. So sending it out a chapter at a time, people can't really tell if you've written a big plot hole or whatever. And I like to be really respectful of my reader's time. It, it takes a long time to read a manuscript, and it's not super pleasant to read one that hasn't been professionally edited yet. Um, so I'm really grateful to them. I'd never ask anyone to read one more than once. Um, to give me comments. And so I try to just give them a big chunk and ask for their comments once and kiss their feet afterwards with gratitude um, and then move on. So I send the whole thing out. I wait until I think it's pretty darn good. And then I find out that it's not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So how did you start writing? You know, I have always been a writer. And I think you will know this too. And anybody out there who's listening who is a writer will know that if you're a writer, you can't help it. You just do it all the time. And so before, maybe you end up writing books, but before you write books, you write uh, grocery lists and then you write, you know, um, blog posts and then you write, you know, Facebook and then you write emails. And my friends are always pretty happy when I'm working on a book because otherwise get, they get these really, really lengthy emails and they're like, there's no way I can respond to all that. So I think when you're a writer, just write. And I, so I've been a writer my whole life. Hardly any of it's been published. Thank God. I mean, really, nobody wants to read all that. Oh. But um, yeah. Yeah. Did you write a lot when you were a kid? Yeah, actually, in fourth grade, I wrote this book about princesses going to the moon. And I like put made a little hand binding and I took it into my school library. And we had the world's kindest librarian. She put a little pocket in it, you know, with a checkout thing and put it on the shelf. And I've never been more proud in my life. I wish I had that book now, but it, as far as I know, it's still in that school library. They probably kindly took it away. But um, yeah, The Princess on the Moon. I love that so much. That is adorable. So do you did you have any that you like looked back at some of your writing from when you were younger or even just like a few years ago and went, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? Oh, I think that about everything that I've all written. I can't go back and reread my books because it's like, oh, cringe, cringe. I used too many adjectives there or whatever, uh, whatever thing I've felt like my writing has progressed. You look back at your older work and think, oh, I wish I'd known that then, which is a good thing, right? It's always good to feel like you're uh, going forward. Yeah. So do you have a favorite one of your books? My favorite one is always the most recent one I've written, but I actually really do, um, I really do love The Last T-Bowl Thief. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that it's a, a two timeline mystery. And so part of it takes place in the samurai period and part of it takes place in modern day Tokyo. And so I got to live in 
uh, 1700s Japan as well as modern Japan while I was writing it. And I love that period of history. And that period of history just like throws up so many interesting things. But I love this book. I loved writing this book because there were so many new things to delve into and stuff that people might not know that I certainly didn't know before I started writing it. Yeah. Did you have to do a lot of research? Because you mentioned that you, part of it is in the 1700s. Yes, actually, I um, I had to go to this little town of Shigaraki, which is in the countryside in sort of ninja territory. <laughs> it's in rural, rural Japan. It takes like four trains to get there. And I had to go to a convent where one of my, a minor character gets sent to this convent. But it was really wonderful doing this research. So the kind of stuff that you discover when you actually go to the place is what it's like in every season, even when it's not nice out, when it's like raining or windy or cold or nothing's blooming or you get a sense for the smells and the feel of it and what stuff is blooming and growing at that time. But you also learn things that there's no way you'd have found it out if you didn't go there. Like, for example, this convent used to be famous. It's It was started in, it's like 1200 years old. And it used to be famous for this healing uh, Jizo figure that people would make a pilgrimage and go to this Jizo figure and ask for healing And until the year 2000 when an arsonist burned down the temple. And it was this devastating fire that burned down the temple. It burned up the Jizo figure. And so the nuns went to sift through the ashes afterwards, and they discovered that, unbeknownst to anybody, the sculptor had hidden inside the carving of this Jizo figure a little metal box, and inside the box were over 3,000 tiny little carved Jizo figures, and they'd survived the fire. So Whoa. out of this devastation and this terrible, terrible loss came this complete symbol of rebirth. Wow. Just as you were telling that story, I was like at the edge of my seat because that's so just, it's just so fascinating. I love history. And I, yeah, I'm prob- I'm definitely going to read that book because I, <laughs> well, I love the split perspectives. Oh, that sounds amazing. Well, thank you. I mean, that story actually did not make it into the book. It almost is too hard to believe. But who knows what might happen in the future? (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's about all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for coming on. You were an absolute joy. Well, you were an absolute joy to talk to. And thank you for inviting me. I'm so honored to be here with you on your podcast. Um, You're a wonderful interviewer, and I love the other authors you've interviewed. If anybody out there listening has not listened to the other podcast, get it right on there and and go right down the list. Oh, thank you so much. And yeah, I'm going to go and read all of the books, and everyone else should. And I just have one final question, and that is, what do you have coming up? I don't know, actually. Um, I am not in Japan right now because Japan's borders are closed. So I'm kind of um, thinking about things. I'm thinking a lot about um, the plot of my next book. I can't do any of the research right now, but I'm starting to think about that. So um, stay tuned. There might be another one in a couple of years. <laughs> Ooh, exciting. For Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. And I'm Janelle Patrick. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after. The end. The end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at Read Between the Lines Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.